Hey there. Get this light up a little bit. All right. How you doing, guys? First person to log on wins an award. And who might be here? Oh, well, guys, at one minute and 20 seconds, I'm going to go start chatting. And we'll, we'll just test. All right, hey guys, how's it going? Not sure who's here. Can you hear me? Maybe a thumbs up in the chat window if you can hear me. Um, I can hear myself, but not 100% sure. You guys are probably returning viewers and subscribers. Thanks for being here. It is Saturday, September 24th. As most of you have probably noticed, I have been posting a lot of shorts on the channel lately. The 4,300 some odd subscribers have been mostly interested in the Mount Everest story and George Mallory and Sandy Irvin's disappearance on June 8th, 1924 on Mount Everest is a fascination for many of you. So I have been posting most of my videos about that story and on the suggestion of a uh, super successful YouTube person, this gentleman suggested that I test out some ideas to see what ideas might work and what wouldn't before I go and invest a ton of time into a certain video because everybody knows, well, I would imagine everybody knows it takes a lot of time to actually create a video unless you do a live one and all I did was hit live. But so one of the tests that I did was really a surprise to me, one that fell flat on its face. I posted a, a short yesterday uh, from a video filmed of me on Everest in Tibet in 2019 during the Sandy Irvin search expedition. And in advanced base camp in, in a tent at night, I sat around with all the guys on the team, Renan Ozturk, Mark Sinnott. Um, Jamie McGinnis and Matt Irving, our cameraman, Jim Hurst, our sound man, and told the story of the day that George Mallory was discovered. And it happened to be the 1st of May on that night. So it was the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of Mallory and Irving's disappearance. And um, it's a good story. And then I talked about how I didn't make it and how I came back two weeks later on May 16th. And I got minus one subscriber on that one. I was like, what the hell? Pretty crazy. So um, it, I, I guess you can never tell what people are going to be interested in. And then, you know, I did a video. My most popular short, if you will, was one morning a bear had broken into my car and I thought it was pretty amazing that a bear broke into my car, but it wasn't in my car. It just left the door open. And the next morning I said, hello, people, the bear broke into my car. People went ape shite over it and loved it. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, this is a Mount Everest channel. And suddenly I'm going viral on bears breaking into my car. So I'm not always sure what to post therein this guy from youtube he's got 250,000 subscribers he goes test out ideas and that's what i've been doing and so a couple of people are like hey where's all your mount everest videos and you know i've got some good interviews in the can i'm actually producing a video now about manaslu and if the garbage problem is going to be solved and what they're doing on Monoslu to go after that. That's kind of, I know, boring, but it's prescient, right? It's important to talk about things like that. Uh, Barry, thank you. 
I really appreciate you being here, Barry. Um, it means a lot. If you guys have any questions, jump in, honestly. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, anyway, so I kind of thought that was pretty interesting that the one story that I thought was going to be a slam dunk has minus one subscriber, but I'm not deleting it. So what it comes down to that there was a popular video that I posted a month or two ago about authenticity. And so I've been racking my brain over and over, like, what should I do with this channel? How do I grow it? How do I make it worth all the time that I'm putting into it? Yes, it's monetized. I admit wholeheartedly that I make money off of it. Not much. I got, there was so little this month that I didn't get a check from YouTube because you need to make over $100 in any given month in order for them to deposit money into your bank account. Now, that interview with Mark Sinnott about the discovery of by the Chinese of Sandy Irvin and the camera, that was huge. That has 308,000 views and it made probably like $1,500 or something. And that's cool. I, I'm psyched. And, uh, but, but, I can't make a viral video every week and make a living off it. So I thought, how do I keep, uh, Kevin S good to see you, my friend. Thank you. And Barry, um, I love your videos on Mount Everest. Don't change. It's what you do. Yeah. You know, you're right. And I think what I'm trying to do is find a way to validate all the time that I put into it. It is fun. I love it. I enjoy it. I love meeting people. Got a great interview coming up that I haven't actually officially scheduled yet for this month. It's going to be in the next couple of days with one of my favorite all-time Mount Everest climbers who did an oxygenless ascent. That's a hint, but my gut is you won't be able to guess who it is. Uh, one of my favorite climbers of all time. Um, I'm about his age. No, I'm still, I'm younger. Finally, I'm younger than someone. Um, so I'm going to keep bringing you that, but it is a lot of work and I'm working, you know, my partner and I were trying to buy a house and, um, so trying to save money or make a little extra money and everything. And it, and it's not easy. So that's all, I guess, in terms of that. But, um, you know, I have, uh, always am interested when I post something, some of the, the comments are, I, I have had to, I haven't um, blocked anybody from the channel in a, at least a year, but I have had some comments that are just harsh and people are super opinionated, I think really about, about this Everest thing. And that's, what's always really given me the biggest level of concern. It's like, why do people get so edgy about someone disagreeing with them regarding the route that they think Mallory and Irvin took the Norton Kulwar or the second step? That's a biggie. All you guys know it. Um, you know the debate if you're Mount Everest fans of Mallory and Irvin. But uh, I think what it all comes down to is authenticity and being who I am. And I do like and truly enjoy my podcast called The Happiness Quotient. And The Happiness Quotient is, believe me, it's, it's Everest-centric. So says John Branch, the Pulitzer Prize winning author who writes sports for the New York Times. Um, it's Everest centric, but I also have musicians and artists and architects and YouTube sensations. And uh, so I don't know if I should be sharing them on this page or putting them on a different page, which I call Eyes Open Productions. It's my other YouTube page that has probably 480 subs right now. And um, that's where I'm putting my Ukraine interviews with the people, the journalists who I know there who are in hiding in the U in Ukraine. Um, that one, boy, talk about getting people on their edge and being angry about it. But uh, hi, Sean. It's uh, not so much about the Everest videos and more about the positive vibe from the channel. Right on. Absolutely. You know, my partner, um, probably knows me better than anybody in the world because she gets to see me at my very worst and at my very best. And um, I, I am a pretty positive person, even when shit hits the fan, even when it's really, really bad. 
I usually am pretty upbeat about it. And I don't know where that comes from. My mom used to say, Tom Pollard, where did you come from? Who are you? And I don't think my, my mom gave birth to me. So she knows she knew who I was, but something in me just drove me to be positive and affirming to other people who I disagreed vehemently with, to accept them, to, to honor differences of opinions. And I think that came from a place of being a kid who I don't necessarily look at now, but when I was a little kid, some of my friends, as we got older, would say like, I was really nervous to meet you. You were, you looked so cool. You know, I had this shiny blonde hair that would curl out and I just walked around supposedly with an attitude or looking like I was above it all. And I wasn't, I was a freak. I was really nervous, actually relatively unhappy kid. You know, I grew up, this is not a sob story, but I grew up in an alcoholic family. My dad was kind of, until I was about 13 or 14 was absent. You know, I guess you could say it. I have, I have maybe two memories of my father before the age of 13 or 14 when he got sober and then he became a rock star, just the most freaking amazing dude who ever lived. Talk about taking the latter half of your life or the latter 33 years of one's life and becoming almost like a saint, saving lives of others who are alcoholics and drug addicts, literally saving people's lives at his funeral. If it wasn't for your father, I'd be dead. That's badass. That's amazing. You know, my dad went through some serious stuff and he partied his ass off all up through his 30s, 40s. And, you know, for, as, a, as a young man, basically his body just died and just gave out. He went, he lost his eyesight. He got prostate cancer. He got lung cancer. It was a com complete and utter disaster, just like dying away slowly. And the last day, two days before he passed away, I lay down beside him in bed and I was like, dad, what's the deal, man? Like, wh where are you going? And he goes, you know, this has been such a good journey. I'm, I'm so thankful for every day. I'm like, holy shit. Talk about where did you come from? My dad was a really positive, awesome dude. And uh, I think I inherited that from him. Not my mother. My mother was like, this sucks. Uh, love you, mom. But um, uh, you and Alan Arnett are great. Thank you, Barry, on giving news on Everest. David, how's it going, dude? Uh, good to have you here. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, Alan Arnett and I look a little bit alike. I, you know, I think I'm more handsome than him. You can tell him that I said that. <laughs> He's older than me, actually, too, I think. Gosh. Um, but when we were both on Everest in 2014 on the south side, that's the year that the the huge ice Serac fell and killed 16 people. Al and I were both, Alan and I were both there on the mountain. And I'd be walking along the glacier in base camp and people would pass me. They'd be like, Alan Arnett. And I'd be like, don't ever call me Alan Arnett. And it was just a joke between us. And we finally got together for coffee or tea or whatever the hell we did one day in our base camp and shot the shit for, you know, a few hours. And so that's how I know Alan. But I guess we're somewhat doppelgangers. I'd like to think I'm a lot healthier than him and better looking and keep my beard a little more trimmed. I don't, Alan is the man. I could, I pale in comparison to Alan. He's such a knowledgeable, positive, kind human being who really, really cares about people. He cares about the mountains. And I actually don't know if I've ever heard him say a critical thing of another person. So I don't know, maybe we are brethren in, in some respects. Um, guys, it's so good to have a few people here. Um, Barry, I know, right? Uh, morning to you all. That's, uh, hey there. Hold on. My eyes are so bad. Trail Wolf, four by four. That's a great name. So you're out there on the trails rocking. Oh, funny you should say trail or have your name say trail. So my latest thing, I've never been into this before foraging for mushrooms. This is my latest deal. Um, my partner is a teacher and she has a friend who said, hey, you want to go foraging mushrooms? Apparently September is the month around here. So she came home with this huge thing of chanterelles and black trumpets, I think. And so we became obsessed 
And now everywhere we go, I'm just constantly like on my hand, like crawling, looking for chanterelles. It's fun. Very, very cool. Um, yeah, Barry, I agree with you about uh, Alan. Uh, he does come. He's a good man. He's a good man. Um, you know, it's not like I'm trying to do anything with this channel, but I guess what the ultimate thing, and I'm not going to talk for too much longer. And by the way, thank you for you guys being here. I do appreciate it. You really charge me up. And, um, but, but the idea is I want to be authentic and when, and, and I think I am, but I don't want to push a video that I think will make people happy because that's not, the reason to put a video out there. And all these YouTubers, the guys with a hundred or two, 300 million subscribers are like, you need to find out what's trending and go with it. And it's like, I don't think Everest trends, but more than once a year. And that's usually in May when people are summiting or dying, or there's some bad news about people leaving human waste and garbage on the summit. So I think what I need to do is continue to upon your, your suggestions is to do Everest videos and also to keep doing the videos about life, about people, about being kind and, and positive. Those are, I'll sprinkle those in. Don't worry. I'm not going to overwhelm you with like Kumbaya stuff, but uh, Hey, uh, David, David has a question. David D, do you wish that your team had any for a, a, a forensic archaeologist with you when you found Mallory? Um, it might have helped with recovering items in a, yeah, in a more sa uh, safer and cleaner manner. Um, yeah, absolutely. David, honestly, the deal is, so I'm, is this 1999, I get a call from a producer at PBS Nova. Her name is Liesl Clark, immensely talented woman who had produced the two previous Everest expedition documentaries for Nova with David Brashears and Ed Veesters and Peter Athens and all those guys. And uh, when she called me and asked me if I wanted to be the high altitude cameraman in 1999, I was like, holy crap. I had literally just bought a house with my now former spouse. We had just bought a house and I had this job in Connecticut. I had to commute from Western Massachusetts. And um, I decided to quit my job for this, for this gig. I was so excited about it. And in my mind, honestly, and here's another admission I've talked about before, one, I barely even knew who Mallory and Irvin were. I'm like, do you know George Mallory and Sandy Irvin? Yeah, sure. Lie. I totally lied. I didn't I know. I was like, and the internet sucked back then. So I'm like, how do I find out about Mallory and Irvin? In my mind, there was no way in hell we were ever going to find anything. So the idea of an archaeologist or whatever had, wasn't, it, it, it didn't even enter my mind. And as the high altitude cameraman, I had no role in it. If I had even said to them like, hey, um, I think you should have a forensic archaeologist on this trip. They would have been like, dude, produce your own documentary. So my thought is that Peter Firstbrook from the BBC and Lisa Clark from PBS had done everything that they needed to do, at least in their minds. They did everything that they thought was appropriate. You know, the the idea of the DNA sample from George Mallory, which I never would have been able to do. I see more comments and I'll get to those in a second. But um, so I don't think it ever entered their mind to have an archaeologist up there. Um, and then on the day that Mallory was actually discovered, May 1st, as many of you know, I, my oxygen apparatus malfunctioned and I turned around and I thought, I'm not going to miss anything. So why not turn around? I, I wasn't like, if if I knew that Mallory was going to get discovered that day, I would have kept going oxygenless or sat down and fixed my O2, uh, you know, mask or whatever the hell was going on that time. So, but now in retrospect, absolutely. There are people out there who are mountain, I mean, there's astronauts who have been to the top of Everest. So you got to figure there's uh, some kind of forensic archaeologist now, another quick thing, and I don't, and hopefully that answered your question, David, but another thing um, that I know a lot, I know more than most people about everything that happened on May 1st, 
and a lot of people are like you barbarians you hacked at the body and and everything like that now i wasn't there on may 1st i was there on the 16th of may with andy when some of the excavation had already taken place so it was easier for andy and i um i'm super hesitant to be critical of how they approached the situation now you got to understand that even on a warm day at 27,000 feet, essentially, death zone, 8,000 meters or wherever the hell it was. I can never do meters and feet very well. But um, here's, here's this body that's been laying, you know, essentially at an angle like that for 75 years with ice, snow, rocks, and pebbles kind of accumulating around him. And in the ensuing years, his body literally froze in. It was like, um, I don't know if you've ever like threw a, an orange out into the lawn or, or uh, like in the woods or something when you're hiking in the winter and you can't get it out, right? You have to kick it out. It's like, there's no way around it. So given the amount of time here, these guys are in the death zone. Many of them took their O2 off. They, you know, they had to chip around the body. And um, that footage, as far as I know, has only been seen by about eight or 10 people. Um, I am very close to being number nine or 11, if you will, to being able to have a look at the footage. I'm not sure if I'm going off on a tangent here. I think it's very interesting. That said, given the time and the extremes of the environment, Honestly, I don't know how without special tools like a power drill or something to cut into the ice, how they would have um, excavated or, or, or gotten to a point where they could move the body a little bit, which they never did. They were never able to actually separate him from the ground. Um, so... Uh, back to David. Yes, I think it would have been good and helpful to have someone there who would just said, everybody stand back. Here's what we're going to do. This is how we approach it. Everybody put your ice axes away and uh, put the camera away. And uh, because I think some of this just people, people want to make everybody sound like they were barbarians and up there. And the truth is, is that they wanted to find answers. And if you look on the body of a man who's supposedly carrying a camera that has the evidence of whether they were the first people to climb to the summit of Mount Everest, if that camera isn't in his back pockets, it's on his front pockets. So they did everything in their power in a short amount of time to try to get to those pockets, which as you probably know, they didn't do. And Andy Politz and I two weeks later did. And that's why I was able to get his watch and a note and other things in his pocket and uh, no summit rocks, unfortunately. Um, so um, so uh, Trail Wolf, uh, yeah, um, I'm having all the different views, angles, and just sometimes another voice on things. You're, you're enjoying, you like having it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, David, thank you. Do you think they got to the top, Barry? The ultimate question, right? Um, so here's the deal. Um, back, un, until about two years ago, I was 100% no way in hell they got to the top. Honest. I never once in my mind thought they did, ever, until about two years ago. So when you go to the body, so you're looking at the mountain, um, me if I could have this right. Like, like here's the summit. Let's go like this. And here's the, is that working for you guys? And here's the ridge, the Northeast Ridge. Just imagine if it's in a mirror, mirror it. And they go up, here's the top, right? And they have to come down the ridge. And let's just say, here's the second step. Mallory's body was like way east over there. And when I sat there and stood there at the body and looked up at the summit, I thought there's no way in hell he could ever have been on the top and get all the way back down there, especially given the fact that they were almost certainly out of oxygen. He would have just fallen down the Norton Couloir or something like that. But, you know, spending time with Mark Sinnott on Mount Everest, Renan, more Everest researchers, you know, the, the, the sheer willpower, the potential of humans 
to do something that's above and beyond the what we imagine is our most profound extremes, I could see it happening. I could see them making it. My gut is starting to tell me that that Mallory made it and Sandy stayed put. There's, I don't know why I'm thinking that, but it changes every month or so. So, um, but yeah, I think that the chances are very good that they made it. And obviously they didn't make it down, but um, uh, I agree people talk about bringing uh, drills and blow torches, but but who wants to lug around an extra 50 pounds at 20, yeah, well, 26,000 feet. Well, just Andy Politz bringing the metal detector up to Camp 6, which is 28, 27,200 feet or so. Uh, that was a lot. I remember putting the batteries in that thing at high camp and it was crazy. So that was, yeah, it's a lot. But, but, it, but on the other hand, it was a well-financed documentary and film, BBC, PBS, I, my gut is if we could go back we, in time, they would probably do that. I will be talking to Liesl Clark soon enough, so hopefully to bring you that. Um, so Barry, do you think the Chinese found anything? 100%. I have no doubt in my mind the Chinese saw Sandy Irvin. None. Zero. There's not even a shade of doubt in my mind. I am actually so positive about it that I'm amazed that people are vehemently deny it or doubt it. There's just no doubt. And people are like, why would the Chinese ever hide the truth? Dude, just do a little bit of, uh, you know, history on that country. And that's nothing, hiding the truth of something like that. It was all Chairman Mao back then. When they got to the top, I mean, they literally signed a person up for the Communist Party at 28,000 feet or 8,200 meters, like with the flag, the communist flag. It was all about country. It's great. It's fine. I love the people there. I've had great experiences with them and appreciate them. Um, but, but yes, no doubt in my mind, camera, coin toss. But, I, but there's also another sighting of Sandy Irvin that I believe is factual even though the story has changed, I'm digging deep to try to get to the bottom of it. There was also a climber, Wu, who disappeared in 19, who didn't disappear, who died in 1975. He was actually also found in about 20 years later by a, a climber. And um, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. Um, it wasn't Sandy Irvin either because his clothes were more modern. These are all stories that I'm kind of working on. I've been on the phone so much with different people about it and I can't get facts. And I know I get the criticisms like this is, this is BS. It's just a rumor. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe it is a rumor, but no doubt in my mind, Sandy Irvin has been seen found on two different occasions minimum, one of them being 1975 Chinese. And by the way, the uh, there was a picture posted from the 60 Chinese, 1960, uh, and they were like, the, the, there was like some debate on was, is this the body that everybody's talking about? And that is not a body in that photograph. I'm just alluding to a debate that came up about two months ago. It is not a body in that photograph. Not. 100% no body beside that photograph where these climbers were angling up to the ridge. It was If it was anything, it was a backpack. That's all. Anyway, I can do a story on that one someday too. So, um, David, yeah, I completely understand. At that elevation, hard enough to move your own body let alone dig up a half buried body. Thanks for answering. You got it, man. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, I'm reading a book now. Oh, I wish I had it with me. Darn it. I'm reading Camp Six by uh, Frank Smythe right now, which is about the 1933 expedition. Oh man, those guys were really getting slammed up there. And uh, they're just at the kind of in the middle of the 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 ridge that goes up to the North Coal, and they see some ropes protruding that they believe were either from 1922 or 1924. Amazing. 1933 expedition, as you may or may not know, is when they found the ice axe that most, 99% of the world believes is Sandy Irvin's ice axe, which I do as well. 
Um, that's that expedition. Um, so, and they talk a lot about Noel O'Dell too. And even in that book, they talk about Noel O'Dell for a while doubting himself, thinking that maybe it was two rocks that he saw some coming up over the ridge. The plot thickens. Um, yeah, Barry, you're welcome. Um, so, uh, as an outlandish theory, could the Chinese team have found Sandy and pushed him off the side? Not even as a political move, but as a mark of uh, respect and burial. Yeah, 100%. A lot of people surmise that his body was pushed over to the Kangsheng face side. That's the east side of Everest. And um, back in 1990-something, and I'm on this one too, a woman climbing on the Kangsheng face found a back, a metal framed backpack on the Kangsheng face, which would mean either Mallory or Irvin, or maybe a 33 or 38 expedition threw it over. Um, could be a Mallory and Irvin backpack from their oxygen that was either on Sandy or Mallory or Irvin threw over. I'm working on that one too. My God, I wish I could do this as a full-time job. I would if I could, but I'd need about 100,000 more subscribers. Literally. No, I, I probably wouldn't even be able to make a living with $200,000. Uh, but that I could. 200,000 subscribers. I think that's what you need is like the magic number is 200,000 subs or something like that. I've got 4,300 and uh, I'm not getting rich. It's fun. It's exciting to see Google deposit money into my my account, knowing that they're sucking every bit of like information and knowledge about my life and, you know, my children and every place I've ever been. They might as well give me a little money back. Right. So uh, uh, any plans of ever going back to Everest, Kevin? Um, well, no plans. But would I ever go back? Yeah, 100 percent. But the deal is I'm not sure if I would go back to altitude now. Um, I, I'm absolutely hoping to go back at least to the south side of Everest in 2024 for the 100th anniversary of the disappearance of Mallory and Irvin. There's an organization, a, a foundation, the George Mallory Memorial Foundation or something. They're going to put a cairn up uh, near, near base camp to commemorate the disappearance of George Mallory and hopefully Sandy Irvin. And uh, I would like to be there at that. And I still am trying to figure out whether I should do a trek where we invite people to come together and do a journey, a pilgrimage, if you will, to Everest Space Camp. Granted, it's in Nepal, but believe me, in China, that ain't happening. You know, you don't do treks to base camp in China. They don't let anybody in there. They're not letting literally anybody in there now unless you're Chinese, but they don't let trekkers go to base camp anymore. Uh, so, um, so uh, yeah, exactly. Trail, uh, trail wolf four by four. Damn, I'd like to see some four by fours right now. Um, Barry, um, if he was, why not say as a high altitude climber, do you want, hey, Barry, could you re-ask the question? I know you were commenting on something I just said. Um, yeah, I I think that you're you're referring back to um, the idea that that the Chinese saw Sandy Irvin on very likely on the ridge, which is where I believe they saw him or, or darn near. And then my gut is that he Sandy stayed on the ridge. That's my thought. And uh, now I'm not making a profession. Uh, I'm not professing this. Um, as fact, I'm just saying, I believe that that's what happened and that he was too tired to continue walking or moving. And George had an, a little bit of strength and in trying to come down from the ridge, that's where he broke his leg. How the hole got in his head, I have no idea. Um, oh, if he was pushed. Yeah, right on. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, bodies get thrown off over to the other side from time to time anyway. Was it a sign of respect or was it a sign of disrespect? Hard to say. If you've read the at the very end of Mark Sinnott's book about our 200, 2019 expedition, Mark read a report. I believe it's in there, unless it's just a story 
Mark told me that he didn't want to publish. I'm revealing it to you here uh, that that there were some of the people on the expedition who came across the body and s took their ice axes and you know smashed him out of disrespect. That's disrespect, you know. But uh, in terms of bodies being pushed over for respectful reasons, um, in 2001 on an expedition that I helped organize and unfortunately couldn't go on, a buddy of mine was going up the Diratissima up the North Face, up the Japanese Kuwar, and um, was pretty high up. And he and his climbing partner moved to the side of essentially like kind of a cone that had straight up the face. And they looked up and saw something falling, like tumbling down. They just thought it was a rock. And it was a person in a sleeping bag who had died a couple of years before. And that was a respectful thing, believe it or not. But he, they had to get out of the way so the sleeping bag filled with a frozen body didn't hit them. So people do discard bodies like that. Um, it's unfortunate, but part of the true. Um, yeah, same as in 1996, right on. Uh, Jack, hi. I was just reading about how K2 had the most summits ever this year. It's starting to have a trash problem. Yep. Also, isn't K2 much more difficult? I believe um, around 200 people summited this year. I know. Yeah. You know, when I was younger, you know, like when I was really getting into the high altitude mountaineering stuff, probably back to when I passed K2, I walked by it on the on the um, Gasherbrum Glacier going to Gasherbrum 2 in 1996. I remember looking up at K2 just thinking, that's the holy grail of 8,000 meter peaks. And then you pass Gasherbrum 4, which is just, just a few feet under eight, a few feet, a few meters under 8,000 meters. And it's like the 16th highest mountain. Talk about a holy grail. And um, I thought to myself, that I'm going to come back and do K2 someday. And as it would turn out, um, my wife got pregnant in, in a year or so at the, after that. And I thought K2 is, would, Everest is just a little bit, you know, irresponsible. K2, when you have kids, full on irresponsible. So I just gave up dreams of climbing K2. And this year, it just got, it got ridiculous. There are just floods in floods of commercial climbing expeditions with immensely talented and capable Sherpa teams and Porter teams putting ropes and carrying equipment up there. Any, anything that mystified me or lured me about K2, completely gone. It just, it's still, yes, more dangerous. And I do believe that there is an absolutely huge disaster that will happen in the future. People get trapped up high. If there's a hundred people up high and a storm like that happens, that happened in say 86 or what was the one in 2008, there could be dozens of people could die, but it just lost it for me. Like I have, unless I was going to go do a new route, but let's be real. I'm 61. I can't do a new route, but I would go to base camp and cheer people on. Go, go, go. That would be actually fun. Um, Pakistan, most beautiful country I've ever visited in my life, bar none, bar none. Trekking in, taking the Jeep in over the Karakoram Highway, which was terrifying. The most beautiful country I've ever been to. Oh, my God. You have to go someday. Okay. Um, let's see. How will the trash get, how will the trash issue get sorted? All right. I'm going to not bore you for two. Let me go five more minutes and then I'm going to bail, but how will the trash issue get sorted? Here's the deal. In um, Pakistan, they've said that they're going to levy huge fines and penalties for companies that are littering and leaving trash behind. And it's it's that's good. Pakistan should, because they've got a lot of Nep Nepali commercial expeditions bringing ton literally tons of gear up the mountain and leaving a lot of it behind. Um, I hope you just got the uh, inside scoop on that. I think it's the commercial expeditions that are primarily responsible for this. They're bringing so much shit up the mountain. And at the end of the expedition, they're like, we're out of here. Totally understand. Let's bail. They should have a whole team set aside 100% for garbage. That's how you, if you're a 19 year old Sherpa and you want high altitude experience, 
here's your deal. We're going to pay you minimal money, just enough to send money home to your family, and you're going to clean the mountain. What? Yeah, you do one year, and then next year we'll give you a summit bid. That's how you do it. It's the only way to do it. In Nepal, if you've watched my Everest document, uh, my Everest video that I did with the Musa Masala organization, um, I talked to a woman who represents the, the Sagar Martha Pollution Control Committee. Uh, and, and they do have fines and you do pay deposits that are not returned to you unless you show that you've returned eight kg of garbage or junk uh, after you return from the fixed ropes at this place called Crampon Point, which is kind of beyond base camp. So um, the, apparently there's a lot of little, you know, like here, if I give you this money, don't say anything about it. We just left 30 tents and a dead body and a lot of human feces up at the mountain. They, they need to really buckle down, but it's Sherpa and I love them. This isn't, they're a very small community, but imagine being a Sherpa who's told that you have to levy a fine against, so you're just this guy who works for SPCC. And, and if, if you see anybody break the rules, you have to give them a $10,000 fine. Right. Okay. So here I am, this, this Joe, average Joe, and one of the most powerful guiding commercial climbing expeditions in the world that is making literally millions of dollars. You're going to pay 10,000. Hey dude, ping, I could crush you. So they're scared. They're not going to do it. They need some outside agency to come in and oversee it. It's just not going to work from within the government. Hate to say it, newsflash, the government in Nepal is somewhat corrupt. And um, they made $4,000, 4 million dollars off permits in 2019, I think it was, $4 million on just the permits. Holy shit. It's a lot of freaking dough that goes directly into the government. You take that, I take that. Are they doing it to keep the mountains clean? A little bit. All right. Uh, David, uh, all right. This. right. Let's see if... Uh, Yes, the, the the also the Pakistan Interior Ministry has raised the permit fees to twelve thousand on on K two. Right, Ed, right on. Um, and Ed, uh, Irvin is much lower than Mallory, embedded in the Rongbuk Glacier, that or has been removed. Um, Ed, actually, my mentor Bradford Washburn, who was one of the great aerial mountain aerial photographers who's ever lived. And um, he was the founder of the modern day Boston Museum of Science. He always said he's down at the bottom of the North Face. Go straight up the wrong buck proper and look for Irvin. And it's really hard. It's not like you just because when you go into Everest, you kind of take a left turn up the, the east wrong buck to get to base camp. If you go straight up the wrong buck, it's it would take days and days over massive glacial crevasses and things. But I, Jochen Hemleb and I have talked about going up there to look someday. We'll see if we ever get there. We need funding. Who's out there who wants to give a million dollars? Mm. All right. With enough Sherpa support. Oh, uh, David. So let me get through these real quick and then I'm going to bail Ed right on. Um, a few months back, I was dreaming and thought about technology getting better and better to the point that they put a ski lift on the top of Everest. That is not too far from the truth. Word is that the Chinese, number one, they built a super highway right to base camp. The nicest road I have ever driven on in my entire life goes right, right essentially to the Rongbuk Monastery. Amazing. They are building a mountaineering museum there that is the size is going to be the size of five super Walmarts. That's at Mount Everest, essentially Mount Everest Base Camp. That's true. That's happening. Another thing that I heard, um, listen to me, rumor man. Another thing I heard through the grapevine. No, Mark Sinnott, through his research, found this out. So I'll blame it on him if it's bullshit. Um, that they literally want to build a lift that takes people from advanced base camp up to the North Coal. I don't, that sounds absurd to me. But that get, that would get you to 23,000 feet on a chairlift. That's badass. Actually, I would do that as an old man, but I almost died anyway at 23,000 feet three years ago. So, 
But anyway, yeah, not too far from the truth. Okay, so uh, Joseph, with enough Sherpa support, things got a lot easier on K2. Yeah, right on. Um, seeming to be getting the Everest treatment. So true. Read, read that the, um, the, the pinnacles were conquered uh, after Sherpa... Yeah, the fixed ropes through the entire route. I think you're talking about the Northeast Ridge proper through the pinnacles. Yeah, there was a lot of Sherpa support. I think that was 96, um, 95, something like that. Yeah, a lot of lot Sherpa power, man, is the most. That was a, like my joke with my buddy Lakpa Sherpa. There's a lot of Lakpas, but my really close friend uh, who without him, I probably wouldn't have made it to the summit so quickly. I always used to say Sherpa power. Quick side story. We're coming down from the summit. We had left camp three, descended to the bottom of the Lhotse face. And my pack was huge. I was like, I am a badass. Oh my God. And anyway, we sit down with all the ice fall doctors and they're handing up me cookies and tea and stuff like that. And I, Lakpa, we're just sitting out in the sun like that. I said, Lakpa, check out my backpack. It's freaking heavy, dude. And he's like, oh yeah, really? So he stands up and he puts my backpack on and he literally just started laughing. I'm like, what? What the hell are you laughing about? And he goes, try mine. And I was like, Ugh! I couldn't even move it. It was like a rock frozen into the glacier. I was like, Sherpa power. They are superhuman, beautiful, amazing human beings. My God, without them, there'd be zero people on the summit because they probably wouldn't give a rat's ass to go to the summit. It's just us. Ooh, how big, how famous will I be if I summit Mount Everest? My God, it's all ego and ambition. I'm talking long, a lot of talking. I've already gone more than five minutes. Um, yeah, re, uh, jo, yeah, David, I could see the... Yeah, 2000 and you get a five minutes helicopter ride to the top. Oh man, I've got a great helicopter story. Last story, um, back in the 90s, after I'd come back from Gasherbrum 2, I was doing this work for a company called Command Aircraft, Command Aerospace, a guy by the name of Charlie Command, who invented this helicopter called the K-Max, you know, standing his last initial. And the K-Max was this skinny little helicopter that was built for selective cut forestry. And it had these rotating, they had two main uh, rotors that went opposite directions and it didn't have a tail rotor. And you could be really precise with this helicopter. And I was a, I was a cameraman. And so we would film with these hot shit uh, you know, Navy pilots and stuff like guys in helicopters who would literally they go, well, I'm going to go do a loop to loop. And they do a loop to loop in this huge helicopter. Oh my God, it's just terrifying. So I said to this guy who worked at command, I was like, could you put one of those on the top of Mount Everest? And he goes, hell yeah, absolutely. We could. So we talk about it. I'm serious. I'm like, why don't you, we'll be on the summit. I'll stand on the summit and you have the helicopter. I'll film the helicopter and the helicopter films me. Boom. So suddenly we get all this energy toward, going toward it. We write a letter to Sir Edmund Hillary asking permission. Hey, Sir Ed, would you be, what do you think about this? And he wrote a letter back. And unfortunately the guy had it signed to him. So it isn't a letter to me rip off, man. I got scammed in that one. But anyway, he's, Ed Hillary said, yeah, I'd support it. Go for it. I think it's probably stupid. Like who cares? But anyway, we got full permission to do it from Sir Edmund Hillary, started putting the budget for the expedition together. The guy puts it on the desk of Charlie Command and Charlie Command's like, that's a $6 million helicopter that the government of China or Nepal will never let us take back home. He goes, I'm not paying for that. So Charlie Command nixed it. The bastard. Anyway, so uh, yeah. So guys, um, thank you for being here. I just wanted to test this. And in my next live stream, I think what I'm going to try to do is put pictures up. You know, like here's some video. Uh, here's here's a here's a a slide. Here's here's a letter I got. Uh, yes, the a pilot Joseph, a pilot did touched down on the summit of Everest some years ago. We would have beat him to the punch by at least a decade. Um, so uh, that's what I want to do. Oh, real quick. See this picture right there? 
that's me swimming in high school in the in the Massachusetts State Championships. I was a butterfly. I got a full scholarship to a Division One school to swim. And anyway, the team that I swam with in all through high school and college was called Sunrise Swim Club. And uh, we had a reunion. Some of these guys, men and women, I hadn't seen in 40 years, including a coach named Mark Mickelson, who I say is the most important human being, other than my parents having sex and giving birth to me. I'm not trying to be a pig. I just, the truth, I wouldn't exist without them. But Mark Mickelson, <laughs> I know I'm going off on a tangent here. Mark Mickelson, by far the most important human being who has ever lived in my life. He was just the most incredible, like kind of ruled with an iron fist, but I needed it. I needed some, some context. I just, I, I would have been a much better guitar player if it weren't for Mark. He made me sell my skis, told me to stop practicing my guitar and just train. I trained double sessions or triple sessions for six, seven, eight years. And that's how I got through college. Pretty cool. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Trish. Yeah, I appreciate it. Oh, oh, that's Trail Wolf again. Man, you are in. Love Trail Wolf 4x4. Best name so far, unless you guys want to change your name and try to um, have a better uh, username than that. But um Okay, where you can, I'll try to make the next live stream where you can answer the burning question on the Yeti. If the Yeti had something to do with Mallory and Irvin. Damn, love it. Okay, that's the next live stream. Hey, Sean, uh, fun chat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Guys, I can't thank you enough. Seriously, um, I love doing this. And I figured I'd do a live just to say hi not exactly busting at the seams with viewers, but I do appreciate you all so much and you're all so respectful and kind. And that's what this is all about, building a community. And look at that, look at that pretty, pretty, oh my God. <gasps> oh, my heart goes pitter pat. That's, that's the person that made this coffee for me before my live. Anyway, that's, that's Kristen and she rocks, man. Yeah, wow, no Simba. My cat didn't show, but better even. Anyway, guys, I love you. Uh, stay in touch and I will put some good stuff on real soon. Seriously, much love and respect. Have a beautiful day. Do something kind for someone and make their day. The, the amazing thing that could happen if you hold the door or say something kind to somebody at the supermarket or say, hey, young man, how you doing? You look fantastic today. Great job on the skateboard or whatever. Do it. Let's make the world a better place because we can do it. Just, Just this small community right here. Peace out. And I see that. Thank you, David.